There's a wonderful forthright capacity to make up extra language in Anglo-Saxon. The words are, are very clear and direct. Bone and house, for example. Bone house, there you have the house for the body, a word for the body. Beautiful words for instruments. Uh, the harp is called uh, gleobeam, the glee beam, the happy, the happy wood, or else uh, the joy wood, uh, I think so, goman wudu. Swords uh, or shields. The shield is the war board, weak board. Old English was flourishing. The adventure was underway. But while the seeds of English had come from these Frisian shores in the 5th century, so now, in the late 8th century, a potential destroyer was preparing his battle fleet 500 miles or so to the north. In the late 8th century, the Latin-based culture of scholarship, which had grown up in places like Lindisfarne, and which had also been the cradle of Old English, faced extinction from across the sea. These ruins are of the medieval monastery that stood on the island of Lindisfarne. It was the Vikings who sacked and burned the religious centre that stood here before. To these pagan pirates rampaging out of their longships in 793, this great centre of Christian piety and scholarship, a pivotal place in the survival of the Word and the Gospels, was no more than an undefended treasure house. The jewels that graced the books of the church became baubles around a Viking's neck. Over 12 centuries ago, their arrival was not so cheerful. To many, it seemed to signal the end for civilization. A year after raising Lindisfarne, the Vikings returned and sacked Jarrow, the abbey, where Bede had been the greatest scholar in one of the finest libraries in Christendom. This stronghold of the Latin word, where English was also being written down uniquely among European dialects, was burned to the ground, its books with it. Within five years, the Viking invaders, who were now called Danes, controlled the north and east of the country. Of the old Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, only Wessex still held out. Old Norse, the language of the conquerors, was spreading throughout the land. Old English potentially faced the same fate as the Celtic language it had supplanted, virtual oblivion. English was in need of a champion, and it found one. King Alfred's statue stands here in Winchester, the capital of his ancient kingdom of Wessex. He's the only monarch in our history to be known as the Great, and he's often been hailed as the saviour of England. That may be debatable, as the idea of a single unified England didn't really exist in Alfred's day. What is certain is that he was a great defender of the English language. Alfred, with only a few followers, went on the run into the marshes of Somerset moving, as a contemporary wrote, under difficulties, through woods, and into inaccessible places. His situation was desperate, and if Alfred's kingdom fell, the whole country would be controlled and settled by conquerors whose language would inevitably crush English. But Alfred proved to be an enterprising warrior and strategist. Running free in the Somerset levels, he discovered the arts of irregular warfare and mounted guerrilla attacks against the occupying forces of Guthrun, the Danish invader. The fighting men of Wessex had been scattered, but in the spring of 878, Alfred sent out a call for the men of the Shire Fjords, the county armies, to join him. Around 4,000 men, mainly from Wiltshire and Somerset, armed only with battle axes and throwing spears, responded to the call. Contemporary English accounts described the battle that followed as a slaughter and a rout of the Danes by the West Saxons. Modern historians question that, but there's no doubt that Alfred prevailed. His crown and his kingdom were secured, and more importantly for our story, so is the English language. Alfred left an even more significant mark on the country. 
He signed a peace treaty with the Danes, which established a border running up through the country from the Thames to the old Roman road of Watling Street. The land to the north and east, to be known as the Danelaw, would be under Danish rule. The land to the south and west would be for the English. No one was to cross the line unless to trade. In the course of time, because of Alfred's peace treaty, when Danes and English met, they didn't do so to fight, but to do business, even to intermarry. Communities mixed, and so did the languages. And English, rather than being engulfed by the Danes' language, began to absorb it. Spoken English survived the Danish invasion. Alfred died in 899. One of his legacies was an English language which was more prestigious and widely read than ever before. On Christmas Day, 1066, William was crowned in Westminster Abbey in a service conducted in English and Latin. William spoke French throughout. A new king and a new language were in authority in England. Enemy. Castle. Castle was one of the first French words to enter the English language. The Normans built a chain of them to impose their rule on the country. This magnificent castle at Rochester was one of the first to be fortified in stone. French was the language that spelled out the architecture of the new social order. Crown, throne and court. Duke, baron and nobility. Peasant, vassal, servant. The word govern comes from French, as do liberty, authority, obedience and traitor. The Normans took the law into their own hands. Felony, arrest, warrant, justice, judge and jury all come from French. It's been estimated that in the three centuries after the conquest, about 10,000 French words colonised the English language. The English language had been forced underground. It would take 300 years for it to re-emerge, and when it did, it would have changed dramatically. <laughs>